batteries are booming, people. We have talked a lot about the green energy transition, fighting back against climate change, um, electric vehicles, and how that whole business works in the United States and the global market. Well, now batteries have seen an incredible year of growth, and they're only expected to grow more. So I want to sh- I want to talk about briefly the different types of batteries that have uh, been created in each. Uh, major decade and their general overall capacity here. So um, uh, in the 1900s, the best type of battery was a lead acid battery. It had about 25 uh, watts per kilogram. Today, so then I want to go over to 2000s, okay? In the 2000s, we developed a lithium ion battery. That was the best battery we could have. And it was around 350 watts per kilogram. Today, in the 2020s, we have the solid state battery which is at 550 watts per kilogram. We are seeing massive exponential growth in the efficiency of our batteries, yeah. which is leading to more and more things be able to be powered by batteries. Mm-hmm. First, it was electronics, then cars, then light trucks, now heavy trucks, and eventually they uh, projected to go on to short haul air, short haul airplanes will be able to be powered with this solid state battery type. And then probably long haul eventually. I think... This reminds me of when we did the deep dive on tech on climate change technologies, and we talked about learning curves for different things like solar and wind power, and how um, how the costs got lower and lower the more we used them. Well, obviously, the more we use these technologies, the efficiency also gets better and better, and so that's where we're seeing this exponential curve that is. Um, that is hitting the levels of efficiency we need right when we need it. To. Exactly. And this this is a really interesting uh, metric, the improvement rate of batteries. Mm. So the way that this company, RMI, is where I found this study, the way that they measure the improvement rate is the relationship between the total energy, energy density between the top performing battery and the number of batteries that are accessible on the market. That are currently in use. Mm. So right, we have gone from an improvement rate of around seven percent between 1993 and 2020. Um, that has been the average improvement rate. 2023, we've shot up to an 18 percent improvement rate, yeah. which is just a doubling of our capacity um, or our growth capacity, which is just awesome. If we can continue that trend, batteries are just going to be everywhere very, very fast. Yeah, and batteries. I was thinking about this earlier this week. Batteries are so like. I can't even articulate how important they are, especially when we have the main problem of a, uh, a an economy that's powered by clean energy being it, intermittency, right? Where right. the sun doesn't always shine, wind doesn't always blow. So if those are our sources of energy, how do we make sure that people can get power whenever they want? Batteries, that's the answer. And the more efficient batteries get and the longer they can store energy, the less the the more easily we can phase out fossil fuels because we don't have to worry about that intermittency problem. Yeah, and the demand for batteries is only increasing. We saw a 25% demand for batteries increase mostly in the passenger EV space, but also in the commercial EV space. It was almost a 50% increase in the commercial EV uh oh. uh yeah, the commercial EV demand. In top of, on top of that, we also see a tripling of the store of the of the stationary storage demand which is really, really awesome because that's what we're talking about. That's holding in that solar for that cloudy day. That's what that is, that stationary storage. And that's just year over year. And that's just year over year. Yes, a year over year tripling of demand. Unbelievable. That's fantastic. And every year they update their projections. So we have not only exceeded the 2018 projections of battery uh, of lithium ion battery demand 2019 the 2020 the 21 estimate the 22 estimate our 2023 estimate is now um triple what it was in 2018 yeah the the industry has totally upscaled masterfully yeah fantastic. and it's only, and it's only growing more with the inflation reduction act we see the honestly Parts of the South, Georgia, are becoming the battery belt, yeah. where they're just making batteries like crazy down there. Yeah, it's fantastic. A, a lot of the the red states are the ones that are going to benefit from the most from this, that are going to have the renewable energies um, powering them before even a lot of the blue states, just because of where they're located, mm-hmm. right? That's where more of the sun is. That's where they have more of the space so they can develop these huge plants. Yeah. And the United States is increasing their uh, installed battery manufacturing capacity 
rapidly. Again, if we look at if we look at Figure Five, mm -hmm. it's a tripling of the installed battery manufacturing capacity in the United States yeah. between 2022 and 2023. One year, a tripling of our manufacturing capacity. China still has a massive, a massive amount of the market. Uh, yeah, like it's not even close. We're looking at 80 percent of the market they have, maybe a little bit more. But China's growth is going to be harder the larger and larger it gets right now. True. America's growth right now, this is our time to grow. True. Like we're about to hit our exponential boom if the Inflation Reduction Act does what it's supposed to do. Yeah, which I expected to because of the restrictions it's going to put on Chinese technology. Exactly. We're going to be forced to onshore some of that production. Exactly. Um, actually, in 2023, I think installed battery manufacturing capacity will be equal in the United States to that of Europe, if not the U.S. a little bit more, mm. when just the year prior, Europe was more than the United States. Yeah, Europe had like doubled the capacity that we, we had. It just shows that the United States is taking this seriously. Yes. And we've chosen to do this with a planned industrial policy. Mm -hmm. um, now, there is one area where the United States sucks. And that is uh, doing the resource mining, processing, um, and genuinely the production. Yeah. <laughs> um, mining, zero. None of it's done in the United States. Literally none of it, no. which is fine because a lot of it is done by our, our allies, except for graphite. Graphite is wholly controlled by China on the international market, mm. which means that we are wholly reliant on them. Then when we get into the processing, pretty much all of it is controlled by China. Yeah. Some of it is in Europe, but mostly China. Yeah. And we need to decouple that and find friends who can do this same process efficiently. And then, you know, production is all China pretty much too. Yeah. Production it, is the only place where we have a little bit of a share in batteries and EVs. Yeah. Um, but it, the anodes and batteries and EVs are nothing if you can't make the anodes and the cathodes, which all come from China, right? True. So, if, I mean, well, if you don't have the cathodes and anodes, which oh, do all come from China right yeah. now, it's, it's a hard, it's really a tough dilemma. Because we are a service economy and we're too rich to transition to a a mining and like a yes. hardcore manufacturing economy. Right. We're not going down the value chain here. We're not going to do that. Yeah. So it really, it to me, it seems like something where it let's, let's give Mexico a ton of money to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It, it just, it doesn't match our education in the, I'm not saying that we can't do it. I'm saying that we are educating people at a level where they don't they won't want to so even if we think that we have the people to supply these industries they're not going to want to work in those industries that's exactly right that's exactly right yeah um and, and one thing that i really love to see is that we have the mineral capacity to get all of these things done mm. so if we for the demand to reach our net zero goals um, we have all the cobalt necessary by 2020 through 2028. Same with graphite, same with lithium, a little bit behind on nickel. But this is just with our current supply that is announced. This isn't this isn't taking into account the supply scenarios that could change in the next two to three years. Yeah. Right. Which means that we, we will probably super exceed the amount of nickel that we need to meet our net zero demands. Yeah. So that, it, it, it makes me happy to see all the pieces are there. We just have need to have the political will to put them all together. Yeah. And I think even that's there now, right? With something like the IRA and it's, this is top of mind for every country. Yeah. Everyone is talking about this. Everyone is talking about the green transition. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm purely optimistic right now. I mean, I'm not purely optimistic. I'm still terrified and, and worried that it's too little too late, but <laughs> At, this is this does seem to be like about the most we could be doing right yeah. now. Yeah, like well, listen, we lost the decade of the 2010s. We should have done more in the 2010s. The mm -hmm. whole world should have done more in the 2010s. Mm -hmm. We absolutely we had the era of low interest rates. We'll talk about that in a second in regards to solar energy. We absolutely should have done more to invest then. We're a little late, but since we're investing now, this is what we should be doing at this moment. Yeah, and we're doing the right things. Yes, we are.